Hello, I'm Dave Doyle, and we're here today to talk about geodetic datum transformations. This presentation is being supported by the Geospatial Users Group, the Florida Surveying and Mapping Society. We particularly wanted to discuss this issue of datum transformations because it seems to be a particular issue in, in a lot of users dealing with historical geodetic information, both horizontal, latitude, longitude, state plane coordinates, UTM coordinates, and heights. Uh, there have been numerous datums, of course, in the United States, and there are going to be new datums uh, coming along in, the, in just the next few years. So this issue of datum transformations is going to be particularly important. We also see it quite a bit uh, in, in the current environment, where there are a variety of different uh, tools that are available <coughs> that produce coordinates in different reference systems, and how do they relate to one another. And while there are a multitude of tools, there are numerous mathematical approaches to datum transformations. We certainly don't have the time today to go into each and every one of them. I want to highlight the ones that are used most uh, appropriately in the United States. Now, <coughs> there are a range of these tools. Virtually every GNSS receiver that is sold has datum transformations built into their software packages. And of course, GIS software has a lot of datum transformations that are built in. Regrettably, a lot of those tools do not provide all of the foundational information that is really necessary for the professional, the professional to know how good the datum transformation is. So we're going to start off with some definitions. We want to start to, to, to make sure that we're all using the right term. Uh, we hear, quite often we hear the term conversion and transformation being used interchangeably. And they're not. They're not. We're, we're talking as professionals now. So conversion really is, I want to change a coordinate system. That is, maybe I have latitude and longitude, and I want to turn it into state plane coordinates or UTM coordinates. That's a conversion. There's no datum change. There's no loss of positional integrity. And as long as the appropriate mathematical equations are being used, there, the data is just perfectly fine. So when you're talking about a conversion, you're not c converting between NAD27, let's say, and NAD83. You're converting between NAD27 latitude and longitude and NAD27 state plane coordinates. Transformations, on the other hand, inv almost invariably involve different datums right, and or large regional or national adjustments. So <clears throat> in the United States, for example, we've had a number of iterations of the North American datum of 1983. The datum has not changed. The internal integrity of the data has changed. And so those are transformations, but they're not involving a change in the actual datum itself. And hopefully this will be a, a little bit clearer by the end of this presentation. So, so as I've given you here in the bottom, some examples of this. Uh, NAD27, North American datum of 1927 to North American datum of 1983, the original adjustment of 1986, that is a datum transformation. Or, now, our current realization of NAD 83, 2011, to the International Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2014. That's a datum transformation. Another, on the vertical side, North American vertical datum of 1988 to mean low or low water, or any other tidal dam, mean sea level, mean high water. So these are all transformations. And all of these transformations come with in, in general, a certain uncertainty into, into how good the data is going to be. So if I come in with a, a coordinate or a height that's good to, let's say, one centimeter, if I perform a transformation using a specific tool, am I going to get a corresponding value coming out in the new datum at the same level of integrity? That takes a little bit of research. So hopefully some of that will become clearer here. Um, other definitions. Regardless, it says, what, regardless of which tool you use, this is a big deal. Make sure you know where that information comes from. 
So if you're acquiring your, your software packages, let's say through uh, a manufacturer of GNSS equipment, they will in fact have datum transformations built into uh, their utilities. But they rarely, at least from my perspective where I've talked to many of them, they often do not necessarily show what the source of those transformations were. So you're inclined to believe, oh, I've, I've bought uh, my package from such and such a vendor, and that vendor created the transformations. That's generally not the case. The, those transformations are going to come from some other source. In ma many cases, probably most cases, they're coming from some other governmental source, or maybe it's an academic source. So understanding where does the transformation tool come from, how accurate is it? What is the positional integrity, uh, statistically speaking? Are we talking about one sigma, 68% confidence, two sigma, 95% confidence? These are important aspects to know and to understand the integrity of the data that you're going to be left with. And as I point there at the bottom, the number of the digits to the right of the decimal point have nothing to do with accuracy. I can't tell you how many times I have seen a tool that will generate uh, a transformation in, in heights out to four decimal places, but the actual uncertainty might be uh, a tenth of a foot. Uh, so you can't always rely on just what's coming out of the computer. You have to have some information behind it in terms of what is this integrity. So let's highlight the issue of conversion, just specifically. I want to get, get that out of the way. So what I'm showing you here is a, a standard example of any GNSS observation that would, would be performed. So you're out somewhere, you're making a, 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 a set of measurements with GNSS. What you're getting originally are X, Y, and Z Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinates. Now your, your data collector might very well be set up to return to you state plane coordinates. But what's happening internal into the, the unit is X, Y, and Z Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinates. And you see those right here. The conversion, that is the change from uh, X, Y, and Z to latitude, longitude, and ellipsoid height, or state plane, or UTM coordinate and ellipsoid height, those are all mathematically well-defined. And there's no loss of positional integrity. Uh, in, in that conversion, but this is not a transformation, all right? So hopefully that, that uh, image puts that to bed. So let's take a look at uh, the issue of datum transformations. So what I'm showing you uh, in this slide are two examples of local datum transformations that have been around for a very long time. And all, all, all they are is a piece of paper that shows the differences in heights in, in both of these cases. They're, they're vertical transformations. The city of New York has 25 different vertical datums. Eastern Massachusetts, 42 different vertical datums. These tools are used a lot by surveyors in those areas. Few, if ever, question anything about where did they come from and what's their integrity. So what they show literally is just an offset from one datum to the next. And you simply apply that offset to get from whatever your da what datum you're in to the datum you want to go to. And I want to highlight uh, particularly this one here on the left. It's an easy one to do. And this may be a little hard to see from where you are, but right here it says USC and G survey mean sea level Sandy Hook. USC and G, that's the US Coast and Geodetic Survey, which is now the National Geodetic Survey mean sea level at Sandy Hook. Well, Sandy Hook is a tide station over in New Jersey. And it was the foundation for the fourth general adjustment of the United States in 1912. It has nothing to do with later vertical datums, such as the National Geodetic Vertical Datum of, of 29 or the North American Vertical Datum of 1988. Yet I have seen, I've talked to surveyors in New York who commonly think, oh, mean sea level, US Coast and Geodetic Survey, that must mean NGVD 29, and it doesn't. Now, fortunately, and I've done some research on this, well, I found the origin of most of this comes from a 1914 publication about leveling in the city of New York. And it's exceedingly fortunate for the surveyors who work there 
that the difference between the 1912 fourth general adjustment and the latter NGVD 29 is only a couple of hundredths of a foot in the city of New York. So the transformation kind of works out, uh, but it's still a little skeptical. You just got one number to go from one datum to another, and nothing in here tells you anything about how good those numbers are. And the same is true over here. You can see it says US Coast and Geodetic Survey mean sea level. Well, mean sea level where? Mean sea level changes from place to place. So it's important if you're going to use this kind of information to be well aware of what the source of it is. And I've never found out what the source of this particular document is. I just know a lot of surveyors in, in those areas have them and continue to use them. So those are examples that are, that are around in many different communities. What, um, what I want to do in this session, I want to talk about a number of different tools. Now, several of them are produced by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Geodetic Survey. So there's the NGS Coordinate Conversion and Transformation Tool, or what they now call NCAT, which includes tools that you may have heard of previously called NADCON and VERTCON, who do, the, who do horizontal and vertical datum transformations. They're being included now in this NAD, uh, uh, NCAT tool, VDATUM, which is a transformation tool um, developed by three offices within the National Ocean Service. So there's the National Geodetic Survey, the Center for uh, Operational Oceanographic Products and Services. They're the ones responsible for all the, the tide gauges in the United States, and the Office of Coast Survey, who are responsible for our na uh, nautical charting. And it allows a tremendous capability of transforming between vertical datums. NAVD 88, for example, and tidal datums, mean sea level, mean low or low water for surveyors and engineers who are working in, in the tidal environment. Horizontal time dependent positioning as well. This is an increasingly valuable tool that allows the, the transformation between NAD 83, particularly our current re realization, 2011, and the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, which is the international gold standard for coordinates, as well as the World Geodetic System 1984. And I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about that. In fact, there's going to be a whole other session on the relationship of NAD 83 to WGS 84, and I would encourage you uh, to watch that one if you're dealing with, if you think you have WGS 84 coordinates. And the last one I'm going to touch on are referred to as Molodensky 3 parameter. Uh, these transformation solutions are found in, as I've mentioned previously, almost every GNSS receiver out there, but few people know where they come from and very few people know the integrity of them. I'm going to show you where they come from <coughs> and how you can get uh, an assessment of how good you think this data might be. So, the datums I'm going to discuss in this session are the U.S. Standard Datum, which is really our first national horizontal datum, goes back to 19, uh, 1900. The North American Datum, which was just a change in name when it was adopted by the Canadians as well in 1913. Then there's the North American Datum of 1927, our current datum, North American Datum of 1983 and the World Geodetic System 1984, which is the defined coordinate system for GPS only. Right, so I'll come back to that. On the vertical side, sea level datum of 29. Note it does not say mean sea level. It's just the sea level datum of 29 because the datum was tied to 26 tide gauges in the east coast, west coast, and gulf. It was changed in name only. No, no height changes to no, uh, National Geodetic Vertical Datum of 1929, and the most current is the North American Vertical Datum of 1988. Now in our island areas, Hawaii, American Samoa, uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, all of our island areas have their own vertical datums, but the there's no transformation tools out there for, for those yet. That will come in, in the future. So I, that's why I'm specifically relating to NAVD 88. And then also tidal 
vertical datums. And the most current national tidal datum epoch, and that's important to note, if you're working in the tidal environment, you must know what the national tidal datum epoch is. So the most current one for the United States is 1983 to 2001, and that's involved in that V datum tool that I, I mentioned just a, a moment ago. So we'll be talking about, about those in just a moment. So just some elements to look at with datum transformations. If I'm going to perform some kind of transformation, it's important to know, well, first of all, what datum are the existing coordinates on and, and reference to? I have to know that. What datum do I want the new coordinates? Now, for, fortunately, that should be pretty simple to understand. How accurate are the existing coordinates or heights? That can oftentimes be difficult to understand. A good example, a really good example, would be the North American datum of 1927, entirely defined by the techniques of triangulation and trilateration. Stations had three different orders of accuracy, first, second, and third, so the, or the integrity of any one given point could be different from, from another one. And the translation, as we move towards NAD83, we now remove distortion that was in that older network, so we're starting with coordinates that are, to one extent or another, by contemporary standards, they are uh, highly distorted versus con uh, contemporary coordinates which are considerably less distorted, could be down to the couple of centimeter level. So you're dealing with different levels of positional accuracy here. That's important to note. How large an area do you want to transform? Now, most of these tools will work over significantly large areas, uh, but is the data that's defined for it, does it cover that area? Do they have nice geometric locations around that area? So it's important to have that information to be able to statistically evaluate the integrity of what you're going to do. Um, the source, the authoritative source for the transformation, that's important to know. Who generated it? Who has responsibility for it? How accurate do I want my new values to be? Down at the bottom, you see I've highlighted in red. You cannot improve the accuracy of coordinates or heights by simply performing a transformation. Um, I, I can certainly remember any number of times during my tenure at the National Geodetic Survey in talking to surveyors in, in a number of different communities, and they would say, well, all we have is some third order heights in, in, our, in our community. Uh, can NGS provide us with a transformation to get them to first order? Like, no, you have to reobserve. There's no transformation tool that will make something better. You may not hurt it, depending upon the integrity of the, uh, the transformation, but you certainly can, depending upon whether or not uh, you have sufficient information to perform uh, the transformation in that area. So I want to highlight this. The datum, now I've done a whole session for Florida on geodetic datum, so you can go look at that, but I, I put this in here because I want to highlight this part. The characterization is a set of passive or active physical monuments that, that are defined the, the, the coordinate system. That is the realization. And that's an important part to understand. If I have a datum, if some source is giving you a datum, then there has to be some way in which you can realize it. Realization is the term we like to use now. That is, I want NAD83 state plane coordinates. There has to be a source for it from, from some authority that, that defines it. That's the National Geodetic Survey. And they provide a huge range of stations. So that's an important part of understanding any of these datum transformations. And we'll look at that. So I'm going to quickly talk about some things, you, if you run into them on occasion, and I don't see this very often, but since this was a, 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 a presentation on datum transformations, I felt like it was a good place to put this in. We have, we have datums that pre-exist the US standard datum. So there was a considerable amount of geodetic work being done in the United States long before we had a national datum. The control was being developed in various areas so that ultimately the, the agency could produce the important nautical charts that was the foundation for them. And from, a, from, a, from time to time, I'd be approached to, hey, I've got a, 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 a chart, a map or a chart that was done in 1865. Uh, how do I get that chart 
into NAD83? Well, regrettably, there is no standard tool for doing this. So I just want to highlight some of the things that you can do if you run into that, into that equation. So what I have here, it, it just an example. There's a station, Cape Hancock Astronomic. Um, it, it's a, uh, an astronomic station in, in the state of Oregon. It has a position on what was known as the Bessel ellipsoid. Again, this is long before we had even the US standard datum. So we have a published uh, position on the Bessel ellipsoid. How do I attempt to get that from Bessel up to NAD 83, in this case 1991? That's the realization of the high accuracy reference network for the states of Washington and, and Oregon. So the user had, a, had come to me and said, he wanted to be able to try and find this station. How could he realistically come up with a, a significant coordinate that, that would be relatively close to what was out there today? So it's not a terribly difficult process, but you just kind of have to know the thought process. So what I do, what anybody can do, you go into the NGS database, you can extract information on stations that are of roughly the same time frame. So in this particular station, <clears throat> this goes back to the 1860s, I find these three other stations, Cape Disappointment, Baker East Base, and Scarborough Hill, all 1851. So they're from the same time frame as this astronomic station. They are also happen to have been brought forward in time into NAD 83 through the, the adjustment of the, all the triangulation network. So they have, NAD 83 1991 coordinates. And then all I have to do is I know their Bessel ellipsoid coordinates. I simply subtract them from their, their current NAD 83 1991 coordinates. And since they're all in the same general area and it's only an, a, 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 a good approximation, I can just average them and say, well, a pretty good approximation for what this astronomic station was in, in, uh, on the Bessel ellipsoid, now in NAD 83-1991, would be this value down here simply by applying um, that, uh, th those, those numbers. So that's one way to approach it. There's this very similar approach on the vertical side as well, because there are no transformation tools that are pre-NGVD29. And there are four vertical datums in the United States before NGVD29, the first, second, third, and fourth general adjustment. Now again, these don't come up all that often, but occasionally when they do, and people will call NGS, there's no tool. You have to be able to perform this by yourself. So, Again, a simple uh, cheat sheet, if you will, <coughs> to go through this. You can get NGS to hopefully do some research. Now, the benchmarks that, that were uh, uh, part of those vertical datums, uh, they're published. A lot of that data is published out there, but not necessarily in the NGS database. They are in older publications, and you have to know where those publications are. So you can request that from NGS. You can submit a request to NGS to say, hey, I, I have a, a, a problem in a particular area and I need to know the height difference before NGVD 29 to either the first, second, third, or fourth general adjustment. <clears throat> well, somebody would have to go do that research. And that, as it says here, that could take some time. Once you have some heights, you can also, and I found this to be a very, very successful way of doing this. Because the, the Coast and Geodetic Survey was performing the primary leveling lines, they weren't reaching out into lots of other communities. They were providing the, the trunk lines, if you will, the primary leveling lines across the country. But then the US Geological Survey, the folks who were tasked with developing uh, our national uh, maps, they would come in and densify that leveling. So there's a tremendous wealth of information about heights for benchmarks that predate NGVD 29 in their bulletins. They're commonly referred to as USGS bulletins. <clears throat> and here is the URL that you can go to. You simply type in that URL and then you request in a block provided, you can say spirit leveling in pick a state, whatever state you want to work in. We're in, in Kansas right now, so if I was doing this here, I would say spirit leveling in Kansas. A couple of publications would pop up, and now I can go research 
those publications to see are there benchmarks from USGS that were in those publications and maybe there are some corresponding ones that are now published in the NGS database. And from those, I can do a comparison. I can simply compare their, their values and say, well, the most likely approximation for a height pre-NGVD29 would be based on that, that information. <clears throat> because again, there are, there are, this data is not automated and there are no uh, transformation tools. So just uh, some background on how you might approach that. Now I want to go into those which are most typically used in the United States today. I'm going to start off by describing the Molodensky. This is really pretty simple. Molodensky was, a, by the way, was a, a very renowned Russian geodesist, uh, quite, a, quite a great man. The Molodensky solution is very elegant, sometimes not so easy to, to, to uh, qualify. The idea is I take a latitude, longitude, and an ellipsoid height. I convert it, remember the conversion, I convert it to x, y, and z, earth-centered, earth-fixed coordinates. And then if I have a change in x, a change in y, and a change in z to the new datum, I simply apply those changes, dx, dy, dz which apply, can also apply a, a change in the reference ellipse, and then I convert it back from x, y, and z, earth-centered, earth-fixed coordinates, to latitude, longitude, and ellipsoid height. If you're working in a small area, and the coordinate information, whether in, in this particular case, is fairly systematic in terms of positional integrity, a tool like this can work exceptionally well. When you're dealing with large areas, a whole country, continental scales, such as we are here in the United States, now not so much. So you have to be really, really cautious about how you might use a tool like this. And you may not even know it's part of the, the, the package you're using. That's why it's, it's important for you to understand, to go back to whoever's providing you with a tool to say, hey, where does this come from? What are we actually looking at? So I'm going to give you a, uh, an example here. For large reasons, like the United States, these uncertainties can easily be at the, at the level of, of me many meters, out to 10 meters or so. So it doesn't model these distortions well at all. It takes average values over a large area and says, well, they're all the same. Well, they're, they're certainly not. In addition, <clears throat> especially when you're working from older classical horizontal datums, such as NAD 27, that is classical meaning the, the um, datum is not geocentric. And there are literally hundreds of horizontal datums around the world that are like this. Uh, th and there are a lot of these transformations that are available for many of those countries. So if you're working outside of the United States, for example, there are tools to do that. But you need to be aware of their integrity. They don't have ellipsoid heights. We never had ellipsoid heights on NAD27. So when you're doing this, you have to assume you have some orthometric heights, or what, we might, what folks might classically call sea level heights and assume that those are the ellipsoid heights. So you're right away, you're making an assumption <coughs> that can have an error source. That's a problem. So <coughs> there is a standard document. It comes from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. It is the definitive document about the World Geodetic System 1984. You can find it, you can go, if you just Google what I have here, nga.std.0036, it'll take you right to this document. This is the specific technical document about WGS84. And <clears throat> over the many, many years that I've dealt with the vendors of GNSS equipment, as well as most people in, in uh, geographic information systems, very, very few people have ever said, oh yeah, I'm aware of this document or its predecessors. So, most people don't know it. It's a great document. The Defense Department has done a, a magnificent job putting this together. In this document, if you download it, if you go and you open it up, you can, go, you can find transformations, hundreds of transformations all around the world. You can start on page D-2.1, which if you're downloading it as a PDF, is page 135. And there are all these transformations. And almost every one of them are embedded in all those GNSS receivers. But I can guarantee you, if you're talking to your local GNSS vendor, 
the person who does all your training for you, it's highly unlikely they're even aware that this document exists and or that these transformations are embedded in this particular document. So I just want to highlight it to show you where some of these Molodensky solutions can come from. So now this comes from an official technical source in the United States government. Right? It's not the National Geodetic Survey, it's the Defense Department. They of course are responsible for the defining coordinate system for GPS alone, not for the national datums of the United States. <clears throat> and they published, this they published this document originally in 1987. There's a whole other session, as I mentioned earlier, on NAD83 and WGS84, and I recommend that you, you, you watch that one as well. But I want to highlight these. This comes from the document. It says NAD83 to WGS84, <clears throat> the transformation, change in X, change in Y, change in Z. That's what I talked to you about with the Molodensky, you change in X, change in Y, change in Z. Notice, zero, zero, zero. Therefore, you don't have to be a mathematical whiz to figure if I, I have three numbers and I add zero to, to all three of them, I'm going to get the same number. Meaning, if you're using a tool <coughs> that is utilizing this Molodensky information from the Defense Department, which many of them do, if I type in an NAD83 coordinate and I want the corresponding WGS84 value, or the other way around, if I type in what I believe is the WGS84 coordinate and I want the NAD83 value, I'm going to get the same number because it's adding zero. I'll get the same number. So you're left to believe, oh, they're exactly the same. No, they're not. Right next to those zeros is something the user never gets to see. Plus or minus two meters, plus or minus two meters, plus or minus two meters. And that's correct. That's correct. So the uncertainty of this three-dimensional change is actually the square root of the sum of the squares of those plus or minus two meters. And that's a, this is a good one. So let me give you an example of, of how this might deal with um, uh, older datums. So in this case, NAD27 to WGS84, or vice versa, it goes either way. Again, from this particular documentation, Here's a mean solution for the entire United States, which used only 405 control points. Well, the United States is quite a large area. 405 points has not a lot of statistical va variability to it. Notice the uncertainties that the US Defense Department has already put out there, plus, mi plus or minus five meters, five meters, six meters. So those are rather significantly large uncertainties. You will never see those if you don't have this document. The transformation tools that almost all of the vendors that are out there that are using this, they don't provide that. They will provide only, oh, you input a number here and you get a number over here. Uh, I put in NAD27, I want WGS84, you just get a number. <coughs> it, they, they won't tell you, oh, plus or minus X number of meters. So I'm going to give you some examples of how this can actually work. So here's another one. I go back to the original one, NAD83 to WGS84, which I just presented a, a, a few moments ago. And the, I said the transformations from the US Defense Department are zero, zero, zero. So I highlighted that, plus or minus the two meters. But in the intervening years, since this was first published in 1987, the Defense Department has gone through seven seven iterations of WGS84, which most people don't know about either. Again, that's in the presentation on WGS84 that you can go and, and look at later. What I've captured for this particular slide is the actual transformation that the National Geodetic Survey uses between NAD83 2011, our most current realization, and the ITRF of 2014, which the current realization of WGS84 is aligned to. And here are the actual transformations. Now, of course, <coughs> NGS does not use just a, a, a simple three parameter. They're actually using you know, uh, 14 parameters. I'm just showing you seven here, change in X, Y, and Z. And you can see they're all significantly different numbers. They're not zero, but they're all also within that two meters that I pointed out. So there's that, that uncertainty that pops back up. And they also have, NGS at least has rotations and scale <coughs> that they deal with, which is important when we're dealing with centimeter level accuracy. If you're trying to do centimeter level accuracy and using these kinds of transformations, you're going to waste your data. 
So th the most likely tool that you will often encounter now is called NADCON5 in NCAT. NCAT is the NGS Coordinate Conversion Transformation Tool, and here I've given you the URL. NGS has done a wonderful job of taking two different transformation tools, NADCON for horizontal and VERTCON for vertical, and putting them together into one package. It also provides conversions. So I can convert between state plane coordinates and UTM coordinates and latitude and longitude, X, Y, and Z, Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinates, and I can perform transformations all in that one tool. So it's a very, very uh, dynamic tool, and I highly recommend that you, you make sure that you link this tool if you're working here in the United States. That's going to be the important tool for use not only now, but certainly in the future. And so I want to highlight the way NGS approaches the transition from NAD27 to NAD83. Now I mentioned uh, the Molodensky, which uses a change in X, a change in Y, a change in Z uh, to perform the transformation. And in the case of, of WGS84 to NAD83, or I'm sorry, uh, NAD27 to uh, WGS84, what they used were three values that cover the whole country or half of the country, eastern U.S. or western U.S. What the National Geodetic Survey did is they took well over 100,000 triangulation stations that were part of the NAD27 and they were adjusted into NAD83 and then they created a gridded format to overlay that because the change in coordinates and the change in distortion in the network is not uniform across the country. So it might be quite good, let's say, in Wyoming, and you might have significant distortions up along uh, the boundary in Minnesota with, with Canada because of some third order work that's in there. So there's lots of reasons why there are differentiations in, in coordinate uncertainties across the country. So the way that NGS approached this is to, to build a grid, a mathematical grid that works inside the utility. <clears throat> and what you see here, the little triangles would represent an existing control station. And the phi and lambda, these are the changes in latitude and longitude. Now this is just an example that I've created. So what I've done is, here are some stations that would be in any particular region. Their changes are similar, if you look at them, but they're not identical. They're not all identical. What NGS does is to take all these, these changes in latitude, there's a, a grid for latitude and another grid for longitude, and they approximate the grid nodes at every 15 minutes and say, what's the most likely coordinate that would have been at that grid node based on this triangulation that's here? Not necessarily over here, although this has a, a slight uh, influence in it. It's more influenced by the control here, not something over here or something over there. And the same is true for this one. This station would be more influenced by this one and this one and this one, not this one and this one. So if I'm a user and I'm coming in and I have a coordinate that's in here somewhere, I perform that transformation. I input my NAD27 value or I input my NAD83 and I want to go back, I'm going to get a transformation that is more consistent with the actual change in the coordinates in the area that I'm working in as opposed to something that's broad across a whole, uh, a ho the whole country or half of the country. So it's a very, very talented tool. And there's actually a federal register notice that indicates that NADCON is the tool that should be used uh, for any of those datum transformations within the United States. So I'm going to highlight uh, some of the, the aspects of that. So here's what I've done. I've taken an example. Uh, I, I've taken a, one control point. I happened to pick the station. We are here in Kansas. So I selected Meads Ranch 1891. Now Meads Ranch is historically significant uh, because it was the geodetic origin for the U.S. standard datum, the North American datum, and uh, previously the, the uh, North American datum of 1927. 
So it's a very well-known station. It has good control to it. I just picked that one because we're here in Kansas. So what I've done is this station has both an NAD27 published value and it has an NAD83 published value in the original adjustment of 1986. <clears throat> so using the three parameter Molodensky transformations that come from the Defense Department, from the document that I, I showed you previously, I take the NAD27 latitude and longitude and the orthometric height for that point, I convert it to an X, Y, and Z, Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate. I then apply the three-parameter three transformation from 27 to, eight, to WGS 84 <coughs> from the US Defense Department. And then I bring that back out. I convert that back out into latitude and longitude. And I compare that now with the actual published NAD 83 value. So what you see here at the top is the published NAD 83 1986 uh, latitude and longitude for Station Meads Ranch. <clears throat> Using the Molodensky, I get the values below this, and you can see the positional differences. About three-tenths of a meter in the latitude, 1.7, 1.8 meters in the longitude. Well, depending upon the nature of your work, you might say, well, that's, that's okay. The, the, the two-dimensional change is about 1.8 meters. Well, for a transformation, if I'm trying to maintain a couple of tenths of a foot or a half a foot, right there, I've, I've lost any integrity. But that would never show up using the Molodensky because you don't ever see it. You don't see that information coming from the uncertainty from <clears throat> the US Defense Department. I'm going to do the same thing now, only instead of using the Molodensky transformation, I'm going to take that coordinate for Meads Ranch and I'm going to run it through the NADCON program provided by NGS. Again, the same station, Meads Ranch. I have its NAD27 uh, uh, published position. I run that through the utility, NADCON or NCAT. Right? It now gives me the transformed value, the predicted value of the NAD83. And I now compare that with the published. And as, as opposed to the 1.8 meters that you saw from the Molodensky solution that I had on the previous slide, now if you look at the latitude, it's five centimeters, just five centimeters. If we look at the longitude, three centimeters, which means the uncertainty is roughly about six centimeters or about two tenths of a foot. Well, that's vastly improved over 1.7, 1.8 meters. So NADCON is a far better tool to use. You just know, have to know that that's what you want to go find. Right? So it may, make sure that you, you make a note of that, that NADCON or NCAT are the tools that you must be using to uh, uh, most appropriately perform these transformations. Now I've done another one here. In this particular case, I've gone from NAD 8386, right, the original adjustment to NAD 83, to what's referred to as the hard. All 50 states, beginning in 1989, all 50 states and the territories were reobserved with the global positioning system. And that became known as the high accuracy reference networks. Parts of the country it's also referred to as the high precision GPS. And each state was given its own datum tag. Right? It's not a change in the datum, it's just a tag that says it's a new date because they were done typically by the year of whenever that HARN was accomplished. So uh, we just generically refer to that as the HARN because states were done at different points in time. So what I've done here, again, using NADCON, NCAT, I've taken Meads Ranch, I've taken its NAD 83 1986 position, I've run that through the utility to predict, to transform, to predict what its HARN position would be, and I compare it with the actual value. So here's where you can take a transformation tool and actually compare to real data. And now, because distortion has been removed from the network, now we see that the change in latitude is zero. Zero. It's all intents and purposes, it's perfect. Three millimeters in the longitude. So 
what you're seeing is that because the datums, the datum, NAD83, has improved by the use of GPS, removing distortion that was left over from the old triangulation, now the tools that will allow you to perform those transformations are getting better and better and better and better. And, and that will continue. So uh, I could do this to go from the Horn to the 2007 National Adjustment to the 2011. I'm not going to go through the same uh, uh, routine here just to do that. I'm, I'm going to give you a slide that says just in general. That, this is how good they are. If I go from the, uh, the, NA, the original NAD83 to the Harn in any given state, my uncertainty is going to be somewhere in this range in the transformation. If I go from the Harn to the 2007 National Adjustment, you can see we're in the range of uh, a millimeter to a centimeter. And pretty much the same is true from 2007 to 2011. We're down to distortion in the network that's roughly at about the one centimeter level. So the transformation tools are incredibly good and, and they will get better. And that's one of the, the nice parts of understanding where we're going for the new datums coming along for 2025 or 2026 when they finally get, finally get published. The transformation tools that NGS will be able to provide are going to be exceedingly high quality. <clears throat> On the vertical side, uh, again, it's in NCAT. Uh, but it's the VertCon transformation. It works in a very similar way to what DADCON does. I just, again, picked a, a random benchmark in the country. This one happens to be up in, in Oregon. <coughs> I, uh, I uh, uh, use its horizontal coordinates. I run it through the tool, and it predicts what the, the NAVD88 height was. You can see it's six millimeters. So if I'm working in some area, that's one way in which I can test how good is the tool that I'm going to use to transform my data I go back and I look at real data, and I perform the transformation, and then I can see its solution and say, OK, in this given area that I'm working in, the transformation uncertainty is going to be in whatever the mathematical range that, that slides out. So that should give you a warm fuzzy as to how good your data is going to be. OK, so now I want to take a look at the VDatum tool. Now this is a tool that will allow you to transform between vertical datums. Uh, such as NAVD88 or NGVD29, or certainly GPS-derived vertical heights as well, uh, into tidal data. So this is a, a very, very valuable tool to be used in the nearshore environment, in the tidal environment. So what I've done here, I've given you the URL. You can, you can go and download the software to your site, or you can run it online. I'm using one particular station as an example. I picked the station in Duck, North Carolina. And there's the number of that station. It's part of the Center for Open or Operational Oceanographic Products and Services. So you can go to their website and download the data if you like. I picked one benchmark, 1370D1977. Uh, 1377. There's its PID because it's also uh, a leveled benchmark in the uh, NGS network. <coughs> so I have its published local mean sea level value, 2.396 meters. I use the NAVD88 height and I input that into VDatum, it predicts the local mean sea level value, 2.391, so five millimeter difference. So if you can work in that kind of a range, this is an incredibly valuable tool for you. And typically where you're going to be using this would be in you're some distance away from wherever the tide station is. You're not right there. And you don't want to run levels from a tide station five or six miles away, you want to be able to, to use your GNSS receiver or you want, want to run levels from some other mark that may, ne may, near be, may, near be, may be nearby and then create whatever vertical uh, tidal height you need, mean low or low water, mean high water, mean sea level, the list goes on and on and on. Incredibly valuable tool and constantly being updated. I now want to take a look at the HTDP tool to be able to look at transformations between very rigorously defined contemporary datums, such as the North American datum of 1983, the most uh, current realization, 2011, and the ITRF, the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. ITRF and WGS84 are both dynamic reference frames. Dynamic, meaning their coordinates are changing all the time. 
they have epochs associated with them. Whereas NAD83 is fairly static. It is fixed and stable on the North American tectonic plate. It does have an epoch attached to it, but the coordinates do not change necessarily over time until you get to places like California where there's a whole different set of issues going on. But in the vast majority of the country, it's fixed and stable on North American tectonic plate and it moves, it moves along with no uh, change from, from month to month or year to year even in, in the coordinates. How do you transform between a, what was roughly a static datum to one that is, in fact, semi-dynamic, if not fully dynamic? Well, this is a tremendous tool to do it. And it's a tool that NGS uses to transform all of the coordinates for the cores, the continuously operating reference stations. They are all computed in the most current realization of the ITRF, which is currently uh, ITRF 14 and then transformed back to NAD83 because that's our national horizontal datum and that's the datum people want to use. If you're using tools like Opus, you're getting uh, both NAD83 and ITRF coordinates. So if you open up HTTP, if you go to the utility and you open it up, right in the beginning, here you'll see, here are the input datums you can have. There's NAD83 2011. Uh, all of the datums are listed both as input and output, and there's a whole range of them. It's quite a number. I just wanted to highlight these, that here is NAD83 2011, and the most current ITRF 14, which is related, or, uh, related to also World Geodetic System 1984, its most current solution, G2139, which anybody who's working in WGS84, almost nobody even knows what that is. It was just released earlier this year by the Defense Department. They did not make a big splash out of it. So if I want to make a transformation from NAD83 to ITRF or potentially WGS84, this is the tool I want to use. I can go either way, of course. And I want to uh, open this up because I want to highlight the fact that unlike previous transformations, where you simply input a coordinate on one, NAD27, I want a coordinate in NAD83, or a height <clears throat> in this particular case. Now, because coordinate systems are becoming dynamic, you must have the epoch of the values that you're using. So we're going to go take a quick look. So here I've opened up <clears throat> the HTTP utility from the National Geodetic Survey. And you can see it has a range of different uh, options that you can, you can utilize. And I'm not going to go uh, through each and every one of them. I just want to highlight one. So I want to transform positions between reference frames and or dates. And that's a pretty easy one to deal with, so I'll just click on that. <clears throat> and here I'm going to uh, assume that I'm just dealing with one individual point. You have many other options. Uh, so I'm going to sl select that one. There's our input and output again. And this is what I wanted to highlight. Down here, to be able to utilize this tool efficiently, you must know the epoch of the coordinates that you're determining. So I have new coordinates. What were the epochs? The epoch is the decimal part of the year. So you can either put it in as the specific day, month, day, and year, or you can put it in as a decimal year. This is going to be something you're going to have to start getting used to because as we get into our new datums in 2025, this will become a part of that reality as well. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, <clears throat> and I want to leave you with just a few thoughts about it. And as I pointed out already, do your best to understand what the source of any transformation is that you're going to have, especially if you're a professional. You're going to have to put your, your signature on something. Make sure you know what the source is and that it's a source that you trust. How accurate does the source think their tool is? Make sure they're giving you values that you can then rely on to perform whatever transformations you are. How accurate is that data you're starting with? Be honest. Not, again, not the number of digits to the right of the decimal point. That has nothing to do with accuracy. Be honest about your data. So if you have a client that says, hey, I have some data over here and I need to get it from uh, NAD83, the original, and I want to bring it forward in time, 
to an AD 83 2011, well, okay, how accurate was that original survey done? If it was never submitted to the National Geodetic Survey, which thousands of thousands of surveys have been com conducted in the United States that were never sent or uh, submitted to the National Geodetic Survey. So there's a tremendous amount of data out there in many communities, historical data, that's gonna have to be dealt with in, in future times. It's vitally important to know how accurate that data really was so that when you're moving forward in time, you're able to talk to a client or to your office or you know, whatever the mechanism here to say, this is how good the transformations are actually going to be and can we live with that or do we have to go back and reobserve? So that's all I had to say about this particular presentation. It's important to note that this presentation is, is being recorded uh, in the early part of November of 2021. And I've made a few uh, comments that certain uh, data elements have been just recently released, such as the information from the US Defense Department about the most current realization of WGS-84. <clears throat> so it's important to have that time component there as a portion of that. Uh, I, I appreciate the time and effort. I su uh, certainly support or appreciate the, the effort of the Florida Surveying and Mapping Society, uh, the Geospatial Users Group to support all this. And I always end a presentation with good coordination begins with good coordinates and geography without geodesy is a felony. Thank you very much. <laughs>